good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, streaming in, um, despite the light rain, or hujan berkat, blessed rain, as we call it. Um, but it's Jeff Dyer, so, you know, God responds that way. Uh, um, uh, welcome to this session, Conversations with Jeff Dyer. Uh, we have chosen a Gandhian uh, title, Experiments with Truth. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I think I've, I've framed a, a final question on Gandhi and uh, being rather mad in our ways. Um, but first, let me introduce uh, Jeff Dyer. Uh, there is a formal biography. You can read it in the, um, in the booklet. Uh, but I want to talk about Jeff a little personally, and then we'll get on to our conversation. Then we have time for a few questions, and we'll end the session with Jeff reading. Um, Jeff Dyer, uh, uh, I won't go through his bibliography, um, uh, but he's been called many, many things, including a national treasure, stuff like that. Uh, soon they'll be calling for a knighthood for him, I think. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, we, we don't rub very well in this part of the world with a lot of our national treasures, uh, so I will I'll speak more intimately. And I'll start um, by intro uh, introducing Jeff by talking about Sharia law. Uh, and uh, Sharia law is a very good form of law if you're a stealer of books because you don't get your hands severed off. And uh, in 1988, uh, while a student, I was stocking books in Waterstones uh, in St. James uh, Street in Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, and I stole my first book, which actually became my first library. Uh, it was a book called Ways of Telling. Uh, it's about John Berger and was written by um, Jeff Dyer. Um, and ever since, I've had a, a, a real love-hate relationship with uh, uh, Jeff. Um, uh, he, I, I consider him a dear friend. I don't know if, if it's the same the other way around. Uh, we've only met three times, but we Kali people, we never believe that we meet only in one lifetime. So this has been a, conti a continuum of, of, of some kind. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Jeff Dyer is so prolific. He, the reason I love him is because he writes about everything I love, which is also the reason why I hate him. Uh, so, um, you know, you have this great idea of writing a book about jazz, and then he has already done it. And then you have this idea of, you know, finally I'm going to write about the filmmaker I love best, Werner Herzog. And then he writes a book about Tarkovsky. And then, uh, you know, you say, okay, this is the Jeff, we'll never get it. He doesn't look so sporty. Uh, I'm gonna write a book about Maradona or Muhammad Ali, and then he comes out with Roger Federer. So for all these reasons, I'm not the writer I am because of him. Um, but <laughs> um, we can start off, uh, Jeff, rather affectionately. Um, I've been going through a whole host of interviews with you. And uh, I really came across something that was uh, very moving, uh, where you talk about writing a note to yourself. Um, I do that all the time, too, to try and be the writer that I want to be that you won't let me be. Um, but m my note to myself is, get on with it, idiot. Uh, your note to yourself is, write the book. Um, it, write the book that you think you can write. Or, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, well, let, let me just quickly uh, say that, yes, we have only uh, met a few times, but we've seen an awful lot of each other in the last few days, and it's been great. Uh, but then everything about being at this festival has been wonderful. It's been, uh, it's a sign of a great festival, I think, when all memory of your previous life fades away. So it's like I've just been here all my life. So everyone has been so nice, of course, and I, I'd really like to say a special thanks to the volunteers who've been so unfailingly charming and nice. Um, so the, the particular note I always uh, set, write to myself is, remember, colon, write the book only you can write. And I, I can elaborate on that a little bit, if you like, because it's sometimes it seems to me sometimes, particularly with nonfiction, that okay, people have a, an area of expertise, and that area of expertise could be anything. 
But apart from that, I mean, a given work of nonfiction could almost be written by anyone. All that's changing is the area of expertise. This is very, very broadly speaking. And it's because you go to nonfiction typically for the subject matter, the content. I mean, I always use this as an example. Um, if you read Stalingrad by Anthony Beaver, that's because you want to learn about Stalingrad. And of course, he gives you the Stalingrad experience, all of that. that that's kind of fine. And he knows a great deal about Stalingrad. And then having done Stalingrad, of course, he moves on to you know, something else. My only fear about Anthony Beaver is he's going to run out of war soon. Um, anyway, so that's a, a, a sort of general uh, point. Now, I have not ever, as it were, colonized an area of expertise. I mean, on the contrary, what I've done typically is I've written about a, a subject that I happen to be interested in, and then have moved on to something completely different, which I'm not at all expert in, but I've always kind of nervously confident that maybe I can say something, I can discover something about this new area that maybe experts in the field haven't, have, uh, haven't, haven't noticed. And I always fluctuate between this feeling of, oh my God, I can't possibly write about this, and then feeling that I want to because I want to discover about this. I want to learn about this area. And one thing that I think many of you will agree uh, about this, writing a book about a subject is a sure way of learning about that subject. Uh, and so it's just a way of really encouraging uh, myself to, um, to, to be really faith, to be at one with, as it were, the contingencies of my own experience and also the vagaries of my own nature and to be really loyal to that. I think in a way, there's a kind of, you can make a kind of... Um, comparison with tennis, let's say, and this isn't just me trying to hustle my Roger Federer book, because of course that book is not about Roger Federer at all. But, you know, if anyone is, as, if anyone has got any weakness in their tennis game, it will be immediately noticed, exploited and pounced upon. You can't have a weakness at tennis. Whereas it seems to me in writing that actually you don't need to have that all-round game. You can just really, um, you you can just really um, be be at one with, in some ways, your your deficiencies, your idiosyncrasies. So that's what that's what that uh, note to self is about. Uh, because that happens a lot. You start out wanting to write about something, and end up writing about something else. Um, you know this whole kind of journey of discovery, how does that actually unfold? Yeah, it's um, uh, typical, I mean, I've always written about what I've been most passionate about at a given time. So we can go, we really go right back to 1989 when, no, we're going to go further back actually. We're, um, we're going to go back to 1986 when that unbelievably boring book of mine that for some reason you stole came out, Ways of Telling by John Berger. It's a really, it's a very, very boring book. But John Berger was so important to me because of course he wrote about such a wide range of things. And if you think about his book about Picasso, it really it dissolved this familiar distinction that you get. Quite often in the introduction to a book, the writer will say, this is a book for the, for the general reader. Or it might be an academic book for a fellow experts. And Berger's book, The Success and Failure of, Pica and Picasso, of Picasso, completely dissolved that because on the one hand, it was incredibly easy to, enjoyable to read, as enjoyable to read as a novel in some ways. And on the other hand, it's got insights of such originality that even an expert on Picasso's work would find it stimulating. So he completely did away with that distinction between the general reader and the expert. That was uh, very, very important to me. Anyway, so then we go to 1989, and I'm so, so obsessed with jazz. It's really just, and I, I would get this thing, I'd be lying in the bath thinking, I'm going to write a great book about jazz. And then 
the, the bath, as you know, is a great kind of incubator of these fantasies. And then by the time I dried myself with the towel, I'd think, well, well, what on earth was that delusion? Anyway, and then I did go to, uh, to America to, to, to write a, a book about jazz. And that was, it took the form it did because I really wanted to find out about what it was about these, this music, you know, these musicians that were so fascinating. And the crucial enabler of that for me was, that, was my absolute ignorance of music. Um, so I wanted to learn more about these people, but because I couldn't, I can't read music or understand it, then that whole realm of uh, access was denied me. So I had to fall back on, on something else. Anyway, so I wrote that book, it came out, and as a result of that, I became recognized as some sort of, I had acquired, you know, I'd become, I could have become a jazz critic, but then I can't remember what happened next. I became interested, I think, in something. Oh, I know, I went to Paris to write a, a novel which was going to be a, ven a version of Tender is the Night. Um, and to, because of that book, I wanted to visit the, the cemeteries of the, the First World War, because being, being English, the First World War is a huge thing. And then I became so really interested in this, um, well, it was a, a huge experience going to, anyway, to cut a long story short, I then wrote a book trying to articulate why it was after all these years that the First World, the memory of the First World War was so strong for me. And as a result of answering that question for my own uh, benefit, really, I think maybe I articulated something about the enduring memory of the First World War, not just for an English boy of my generation, but for many other people. Anyway, and it's just continued like that, really. We could go on, and I mean, I'll just give one more example. I mean, with, um, I wrote this history of photography, the ongoing moment, because I really wanted to familiarize myself with the history of photography. Um, and I did, I did really come to know a great deal about the tradition of photography by the end of writing the book. Now, the normal way of proceeding things when you're doing a PhD is you do all the reading, and then comes the awful moment when you've finished the research and you have to write the book. And at that point, you have to write up your thesis. At that point, quite a lot of people just drop out because, um, you know, it's just all that's ahead is work. So I've, I've kind of proceeded differently of the the kind of learning about the subject and the writing about it has, has proceed, proceeded more or less in tandem and hopefully the finished books retain something of that quality of discovery that I was having as I was, as I was writing it. Um, you speak quite a lot about starting out doing one thing uh, and then end up doing something else. And along the way, there is what you describe as the oh shit mo moment. Uh, remind, <laughs> me that moment. remind me what that moment it's is. It's when you discover that you're not actually doing what you're doing and you have to move into something else. Oh. What, what kind of anxiety <laughs> uh, do you go through when that kind of transition happens? Yeah, I, I, I can't really remember that oh shit comment. But, I mean, what, what does happen? I mean, there, there's something I should also say that... Um, there have been a few exceptions, but as certainly as I've got older, um, the normal way when you're doing non-fiction, you write a proposal, um, and that elicits the interest of the publisher. And basically, the more accurately you can set out in the proposal what the finished book is going to be like, the more appealing it is. Uh, I can't bear writing proposals, so I, and I don't like having contracts hanging over me. There was a time when I had a contract. I'll come back to this in a moment. Because um, it's so, I mean, the theme of this festival is terra incognita, is it incognita? Yeah, yeah. And if you're doing that proposal, that's the op that means that the writing is really just going to be setting out in longhand what the proposal has already mapped. So I prefer just to, to there's a subject that I want to address, let's say, and then I like to just... Uh, find out what form the book is going to take. And this is important because I've written about a 
many different subjects, but that would count for nothing if I just went from subject to subject with an identical co cookie cutter. Whereas I think what's happened and what's kept me sort of interested is after a certain point, this is actually the opposite of an oh shit moment. It's a oh, oh great moment. Um, after a certain amount of time spent amassing material, a form will suggest itself, and it's always happened, which is uniquely appropriate to that, uh, to, to that subject matter. Um, and then, unfortunately for me, uh, that form, like some space rocket thing that is then left sort of drifting in space, it's then useless for me for, for the next book. Um, so that's what's, uh, that's what's g going on there. It's that um, I'm always really happy when I sense some, uh, the possibility of a form emerging out of the, out of the unknown, if you, if you like. But crucially, I don't ever project in advance what that form w will be. Uh, it's one of the reasons I've never had any interest in writing film scripts because with films you always have to get permission from somebody else to get to the next stage and to get to the next stage you have to have uh, some kind of map about what you're doing but I like just this um, yeah I like discovering it as I go along. So form is liberating for you? Oh I'm in it for the form I really it's that's the thing that is really um, that's really kept me going. Uh, I think it's been uh, cognitively the most satisfying thing. So the most unsatisfying thing is when several of the books actually, many, quite a few of the books have been described in reviews as formless. Mm. Uh, and that was so wounding to me because um, I always thought the form and, st yeah, the last book was, people were saying it was unstructured, and it, it has the most beautiful structure, in my humble opinion. <laughs> if you say so yourself. Eh? Um, um, Jeff, you know, you started out as a fiction writer. You wrote a novel. Well, no, I wrote the Berger book. I started yeah, yeah, out I as mean, a... Yeah. Uh, after the Berger book, which was really kind of a study, uh, your first book was a, was a work of fiction. Well, um, except it wasn't, because the first book was the book about John Berger. <laughs> the second book, then, was a work of fiction. Yeah, yeah. Well, where does fiction s sit in your life these yeah, days? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's this thing. I mean, Berger was so important to me because, um, I mean, you know, I liked the idea of being a writer, but there was a straightforward split, really. Being a prose writer meant you wrote novels or you wrote criticism about other people's novels. And I was always hampered as a writer of fiction because I could never think of stories. And then Berger opened up this sort of in-between space where you could do something that was both imaginative and critical. It would be a form of commentary and it would be a form of creative writing. So again, that, that sort of distinction collapsed. And then I did write this, uh, uh, I found a way of my first novel the color of memory, actually this links in with the previous question, I found a way, I think, of structuring that book which compensated for its lack of plot. Um, there really is absolutely no plot, but I think the structure of that book takes on a lot of the load-bearing function that is often borne by, by plot. And for me, plots are always, always boring. I mean, as a reader, too, I mean, I've got no interest in, in, in plot. And fiction is kind of interesting, as I mean, to me, um, for for this reason, really. I mean, I've written this a lot on a great variety of things. I think few writers have as wide a ranging area of um, of concerns as I do. But when it comes to fiction, I'm so struck by the way that my fictional world is always the same. I mean, I'm so limited as a writer of fiction. I mean, it, and I think I've come to the end of the road fiction-wise, so it's always the same. It's a group of friends go to a party and then some sort of romance happens. And we can track this really easily. The Color of Memory, group of friends in Brixton, London. The next one, 
Paris trance. Group of friends, Paris. Romance. So we got to Paris and, you know, then the last sort of novel I wrote, Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi. Well, the locations have become progressively more exotic, let's say. So there we are, Venice and Varanasi. And also, significantly, we've come to the end of the alphabet. So, um, you know, it's really, really striking to me. It's part of the, the, the wonder of fiction is that how implacably it brings you up against your, your, your limitations, really. And, um, yeah, so that's what it, that's what it, uh, that's what it means to, to, to me. I think fiction has really enabled me to, has really brought me up against my, my limitations as a, as, as, a, a, as a writer. And also it really brings out to you your, your particular um, proclivities, preferences, and, you know, yeah, it's a real... In that, in, gate, in that creation of a fictional world, it's also such a, you're also holding up a mirror to your own deepest concerns, very obviously. So is that a mountain that you can't seem to reach the peak of? Um, there's lots of things going on uh, here. And I think one of them, it's this subject of noticing, really. So if, we, if, we, if I think of a writer that I really love, I mean, Tessa Hadley, English writer, I mean, I just aghast at her ability to notice stuff. Or if you think of another, I mean, incredible noticer, John Updike, let's say, just the way that he would notice stuff. And I, I'm aware that um, just that thing of being ob of observing things in the world is really quite tiring. And I remember when I used to write travel articles, and I would, you know, get off the plane, and I'd be in a place in a state of heightened attentiveness. And I always found that so exhausting. I think I just don't, I just don't notice enough things. Um, Zadie Smith writes somewhere that she says um, that one of her great passions is people's faces. She just loves looking at people's faces. And I'm not making excuses for myself, but as I've got older, I seem to have developed this really quite terrible face blindness. So, um, uh, so that I, I would make that that excuse for for not being a fiction writer because I'm quite often I'm not seeing faces; I'm just seeing blobs. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a great noticer. You notice lots of things. It's uh, why you don't wear a watch. No, uh, well, that's <laughs> um, um, well, I. I I sort of can notice things if I apply myself to a subject, but I think the, a, a novelist like Updike was a, an accidental noticer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit about your relationship with John Berger? You, you actually oh, wrote the introduction to his uh, selected oh, essays. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it... I mean, the, one, the crucial thing, I think, was that thing of formal... Uh, his relentless formal innovation... Uh, his development of this uh, area of, of the uncategorizable book, which, is, which has been very, very important to me. And then I think, I mean, I was so... I mean, and then I thought I wanted to be a political writer, like Berger, like so many of the writers I'd loved, like Raymond Williams. And, um, uh, and the freedom to not be an expert in a subject, all of this. And then there was this, well, I suppose we should also say something about my personal relationship with him. There's a, a very long history, well documented. The young writer goes to meet the writer or artist they most admire. You know, we can all think of examples. And then, to put it in a rather crudely, the writer they've admired so much turns out to be a dickhead, you know, and it's just uh, that thing of disillusionment is, you know, I mean, uh, God, so many people have written about it, you know. And then, so I meet John Berger, the writer I love more than any other writer, and then he turns out to be the most wonderful human being that I'd ever met. And my friends, this was when I was about so, uh, in my mid-twenties, you know, at that great, uh, great period in anyone's life between about 20 and 30 when you're so responsive to things. And then my friends, as life went on and I got older, they kept waiting for me to have this patricidal moment when I would turn on Berger, you know. Um, 
And it never happened. You know, my sense of just his greatness as a writer and his wonderfulness as a person just in deepened over time. But I think I was so profoundly indebted to Berger that in a way, although I found his formal innovation so liberating and enabling, I think stylistically, he became, it meant that I took, a, I mean, he's so, he's so serious, Berger. I think it delayed my arriving at my own voice in a little, uh, in some way. I think it took, a, took a quite a bit of time to grow out of Berger's influence like that. And I'm only, I've only realized that now because I feel that stylistically now I'm so, uh, so, but, uh, in, a, in a, com such an entirely different register to Berger because at the risk of blowing my own trumpet, you know, uh, I mean, Berger really isn't funny. And of course, I'm just hilarious as a writer and I'm getting funnier with every year as a writer. I really, really believe. But how important is tutelage? tutelage. Yeah. Well, uh, it doesn't, it, I mean, uh, the tu tutelage is reading. You know, it just happened that I, I, I met him, but he wasn't ever, he was never a mentor. I mean, I said some stupid things once. I said once in an interview about Berger, I said he was like a father for me. And that was such a cliche. You know, I had a perfectly nice dad. I didn't need another one, you know. Um, and, but no, I would say that, uh, you know, it was, and he was very encouraging, but uh, no, it was re re reading. That's the, that's the, that's the great tutor. But engaging with a person like John Berger, and you, you, you referred to it just now, I wonder if you can elaborate on it. Uh, you've also written an introduction to Raymond Williams. Um, now, what is your politics? I mean, your draw to politics, the broader politics, the bigger politics. Oh, well, I mean, it's so, it was so, it was, uh, I mean, that amazing session with uh, Edouard and, and Tash yesterday. It was just extraordinary to me because, um, I mean, um, I've ended up not being the political writer that I hoped to be, that I thought I might be like in that sort of Orwell or Hitchens-like tradition or not even like Raymond Williams. But, I mean, really, I mean, that, what Ed, Edward was saying yesterday about the way that one's tears are sort of um, uh, uh, can, are, are political. I'm not doing justice to, to, what, to what he was saying. But... Um, uh, I mean, the experience I had of uh, of, of of growing up in uh, this, uh, I mean, this is very much on my mind because I've just I, I had this totally uninteresting childhood, which weirdly I've just finished writing 300 pages about. But um, here am I, 65, you know, um, and I can now see so much more clearly than ever in my life before. I feel closer to that the person I was growing up in this kind of very, a, a world that, I mean, obviously, I mean, there's a wonderful line of Annie Dillard's when she says, you know, I've never seen a tree that was no tree, that I've never seen a, I've, what was it? I've never seen a tree that was not a tree in particular. And she says, remember, life is always and only lived in the detail. So the experience of my, my experience of growing up in this, um, working class family in England is entirely different to Edward's, entirely different, but exactly the same in a way, except mine, there was absolutely no violence, it was a lovely, it was a, a thing, but that, that sort of journey, I feel, is, uh, that, that thing is so, that working class life where we had no contact at all with middle class people has formed me so, has determined me determined me so utterly, and I'm, yeah, I'm more conscious of that than ever, and weirdly, I mean, all that happened, you know, mine was an English thing, you know, there was this, all I did, I just, you know, I, God, it's such a big thing, you know, it, it, at the age of 11, you take this exam, which would determine whether you went to a secondary modern school, which meant you were fodder for factories, or you would go to a grammar school, and from a grammar school to, to university. So I just rode this educational escalator. I just kept passing exams, ended up at Oxford. 
And I really only realized that there was more to this than passing exams retrospectively when I read, well, Raymond Williams, really, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, can you um, explain or, or tell us a little bit about your sense of geography? Uh, you move around a great deal. Your books are set in so many different places. Um, yeah. How is that geographical expanse from a, a you know, rather, if I can use the word provincial, childhood? Or... Mm, yeah, it was, well, um, I mean, uh, to quote Annie Dillard again, you know, she says, um, she says about, uh, uh, she says about Earth, you know, we're only here for a short time, so we might, might as well try to get to know the place a bit. So there is just this, you know, the fact that it's, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of places to see. And I felt after my first novel, really, I didn't, wasn't really interested in England anymore. And so I went to live in different places and uh, I just found that there was, I mean, what I, what I think I was always particularly drawn to, we go back to that when I was living in France and went to these First World War cemeteries. Um, and there's one place in particular. Um, so if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're British, I mean, the Battle of the Somme in 1916, the first, the, the first day of the Battle of the... 1st of July, 1916, it's this catastrophic day. Um, anyway, so you, come to the, you go to these cemeteries and then you come to this particular uh, memorial and there it is, just written in this, it's a, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, and there it is written in these huge wor words, the missing of the psalm. And there's such a, I mean, it was a very, very powerful moment for me going there. And I think from that, I realized that what I'm always interested in is these places where history and geography come together, where the spatial and the temporal come, come together. And I can think of all sorts of other um, moments, really, in my, in my life where that same convergence of those th two things, geography and, and history, where the, where, yeah, where the, where the, the historic, where the chronological is, is, is manifest, manifested in, in the geographical. Um, and then more broadly, I like places that have some sort of special power. Now, of course, I like going to pretty places. You know, I like going to nice resorts or whatever it is. But there are places that have a certain kind of power. Um, do you know what I think I really like? I like religious places. And I say that because I could not be more atheistic. You know, I'm atheistic in every bone of my body. But, but it's always seemed to me that... Um, you know, uh, if you think of Richard Dawkins, you know, the, you know, the top atheist, the godlike atheist figure, you know, with his contempt for, for religion. You know, I don't know if he's been to Varanasi. If he hasn't, if he, ha if he has, he would have to concede that by virtue of Hinduism being, having been practiced there for all of these years, that place has an incredible power. The, belief system has seeped into every granule of every brick and every bit. It would be totally irrational to think that wasn't the case. I like, you know, and as soon as you, I mean, I, I liken it like this, really. I like these places where I sort of arrive at certain places, and I can never tell where, the, where it's going to happen, and almost like some Geiger counter starts clicking you know, that there is some kind of dormant radioactive power here. And of course, you get to Varanasi and the Geiger counter basically breaks. It just can't handle the sheer uh, power of that place. And then I can expand on this further and say it's not for nothing that I ended up devoting this... Um, um, I, was, I sold a book to a publisher um, and then... Um, they said, would you like to do another book for us? Sign a two-book deal. So I did, and I said, oh, I'll write a book about tennis. Anyway, because I was really interested in tennis. Then it came to it, and I didn't feel like writing it, and I just really dreaded writing it. And then I ended up, just for my own amusement, summarizing a film. I summarized Andrei Tarkovsky's film, Stalker. And 
that film, which I'm sure many of you love, you know, it's this thing on account of three people making a visit to this place, The Zone, at the heart of which is a, somewhere called The Room. So it's this account of this, this play. And the, the thing is about this area, The Zone, at any one time, it's both completely ordinary and it's utterly magical. And, you know, that's, I think, been an abiding thing of mine, this kind of thing of locating what this, what, you know, the, uh, 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 my particular zone, you know. Yeah, that's what I'm interested in. And I think I found that a version of the zone in the real world in, in multiple places. There seems to be this tension as you're talking about uh, things that you're just so curious about and fall in love with uh, and things that come from someplace else, memory and things like that. Uh, how do these things work out? I mean, what's the tension between them? Something yeah. you're fascinated by and something oh, yeah. that hasn't. You know, yeah. I mean, it, so for example, you know, why did that, you know, I wrote this book about the Tarkovsky film. I mean, one, why, did I, why did that film affect me so powerfully? Well, of course, because it's one of the greatest artworks of all time. But then I started to think, you know, something about that, something in me must have been unusually receptive to that film. And then I started to think that that landscape, you know, I mean, those of you who, who know the film, you know, it starts off in black and white, and they take this journey into the zone. And then there's that amazing what moment, one of the one of the greatest moments in the history of cinema when they arrive in the zone and we know we've arrived in the zone because suddenly it goes into color. And that landscape resonated for me, I think, because it was so something and it was so, it was both a newly discovered world for me, but I think I was sort of primed for it because it reminded me of landscapes of my childhood, of an abandoned railway station that was located just just a 10 minute walk from where, from where we live, really, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, there's, I mean, I think I'll leave it at that for the, for the moment. You know, what's always uh, drawn me, Kavali, for example, you've written about Kavali, you wrote the obituary on Nusrat Fadeh Khan, Ali Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you get drawn into some, something of like that to such well, depth? Uh, well, I wasn't actually, I mean, I only wrote that obituary of Nusrat because no one else did. But, um, you know, I mean, um, uh, I mean, with, uh, God, I mean, uh, there's some kind of, I don't know, there's just, I mean, with, with music, it's just, I've just sort of, it just sort of end, ended up there, really, with, uh, I mean, I mean, it was, yeah, with, I mean, I think what I could do is enlarge it slightly uh, from, I mean, Indian classical music has been so important for me and it was, I mean, this is just, this says something about just my development. So I, I listened for the first time to that great Indian violinist Subramaniam when I was in Paris, when I was about 30, let's say, living in Paris. And back then, I wasn't this lovely marshmallow of a person that I've since become. I was a quite aggressive English yobbo still, you know. Anyway, but I loved this music. Anyway, I met this Swiss violinist playing. He was playing in a straight Western orchestra. He was, you know, he was young, you know, he's starting to, wanting to play in an orchestra. So I just listened, got into Subramaniam, and I said, oh, there's this amazing Indian violinist playing, you know, and I gave him a cassette of it. And then I saw him about five days later, and I said, what did you think of it? And he said, oh, I didn't like it. And, you know, I loved it so much. And it was a sort of strange encounter because I took such an affront at this. I said, well, several things. A, you're an idiot. B, you'll never make it as a violinist. And three, if you had your violin with you now, I'd probably shove it down your throat. So it was, um, I just have these passions, really. <laughs> um, and uh, the strange thing about Indian classical music is that for so many people I know who've been receptive to improvised music, they find it so 
So they say, oh, I don't understand it. And of course, all you need to understand Indian, to appreciate Indian classical music is a pair of ears, it seems to me. You know, and I, I honestly don't know if I could have survived my time on earth without, without that, without Indian classical music. I think we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah. it's about time. Uh, yeah, could I have a show of hands? Yes, on that side. And then I'll move to this side. Uh, hello, uh, just two questions. Number one, do you identify yourself as an essayist? Because, I mean, the form itself is like, lacks any definition and structure. And number two is, do you think you have written your best work? Your best book, actually. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a vicious question that last one was. Um, no, I don't identify myself as an essayist, nor do I um, identify as a novelist. Just writer is, is fine for me. I like, I like the capaciousness of that. Well, probably, you know, yeah, it is. You know, I'm not, I just finished this book about, I just published this book last year about uh, careers coming to an end. So I'm 65 now, so yeah, probably, yeah, probably there isn't, probably more has been written than there is still to come, you know, so yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, on this side, I saw a hand. Did I see a hand here? Ah, yes. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I could, it seems from everything you've spoken about that you seem to set yourself up in contradistinction to the idea of expertise, mm. right? Uh, you seem to thrill in being a dilettante, in being moved by passion, in, uh, in the way that I think the, there's something that you brought up where you say that life is best lived in the moment, right? In the details. Life is best li lived in the details in the moment. So, I mean, I guess is... Are you then now, as you said, you're in your 60s, looking back on a large body of work, uh, is, is the work of, is the life of a writer best lived in celebrating those individual moments? Is the grind of expertise over time and, and the gradual and somehow painful deepening perhaps not friendly to the creative exploits of a writer? Yeah, well, um, it, I mean, unfortunately, my answer to that is the rather boring one. It depends. Uh, but, um, I mean, it's, it's just sort of suited me. I would, I would actually substitute. I really don't feel I'm a dilettante because that all... But what I, what I really would very happily be uh, to describe myself as is a sort of an, an amateur, really, in that rather grand Victorian tradition of the amateur, you know, um, and also, I'm so against specialism. Uh, you know, the way my education went, I did about eight O-levels, three A-levels, then I did a degree, um, and um, uh, then there was the question of what to do next. Uh, and, you know, what do you do a PhD on in literature? You will something even more specialized, whereas I was conscious by the time I finished was finishing university that actually I was starting to get interested in more and more things and I thought god I want my um, uh, you know I want to, to, to I want my area of interest to widen and you know I was then when I discovered people like Berger and also Susan Sontag who so wonderfully defined you know she said to be a writer is to be interested in everything and uh, that, that suited me very well. And, you know, I think it's Roland Barthes who talks about the amateur sharing the same route, uh, amatore or whatever, as the lover. So, uh, yes, the, the, the lover of things. Um, and I found it so endlessly rejuvenating getting interested in and finding out about some, some new area. It's worked for me. More hands? No? Okay. It's, it's fortunate that we have a little encore lined up for you. Um, and we decided that, um, fortunately, there's no session after this. So um, it was agreed that this session would be expanded from its originally planned one hour to two hours. 
Um, the doors have been secured. <laughs> There's no, in the words of Jim Morrison, no one here gets out alive. <laughs> and I thought it would be a good idea if I just, if we closed this thing with, this is a little, uh, this is a long passage. It's from here to the end of the book. Um, about things coming to an end, and I, I feel it's just an appropriate, uh, an appropriate thing, really. Um, and then maybe if there is another question at the end, we might have time for that. So anyway, thank you for, for being here. At any poetry reading, however enjoyable, the words we most look forward to hearing are always the same. I'll read two more poems. The words we truly long for are, I'll read one more poem, but two seems to be the conventionally agreed minimum. It's lovely hearing this. You can feel a sigh of relief passing through the audience, especially if the previous couple of poems have been precedent-setting sonnets clocking in at under a minute each. After long months in the sea of poetry, the shout has gone up from the crow's nest. Land! We're almost there. We've made it. We can practically taste the scurvy healing lager being poured in the bar afterwards. But then these two last poems turn out to be the opposite of the sonnets that had served as a double false dawn before the concluding multi-part epics. The felt duration of each is twice as long as Robert Browning's 400-page poem, The Ring and the Book, which raises a question. Why did we come if, while being here, we would end up being so preoccupied by no longer being here? Could it be that our deepest desire is for everything to be over with? We want encores, value for money, bang for our buck. But however vigorously we've been clapping and clamoring for more, there is invariably a sense of relief when it becomes clear that the band, despite our collective imploring, are not coming back, that the house lights have flicked on, bringing the last residue of applause to an immediate, slightly impolite halt, and that we can apply ourselves single-mindedly to getting a good place in the stampede for the exits. Beneath it all, writes Philip Larkin, desire of oblivion runs. So, thank you. One last question from the back. I was a bit reluctant to ask this question earlier, Jeff, because it's a bit personal, but since we are locked in with you, I thought I might as well take the opportunity. Two takeaways from me from what I've heard you speak. The first one was about being a, an accidental noticer. Just because you're a writer, it's not like you notice everything or you have exceptional ability to notice. So you are. Uh, very frank in telling us that perhaps you are an accidental observer. And the second takeaway for me today was when you spoke about the power of place and relating it particularly to Varanasi. Varanasi being a place that gave me personally a very huge slap in the face. Such was its impact. So my question to you is, bringing these two elements together, was there um, something that you noticed about Varanasi to you know, associate it in this day, uh, on, the, on, the, on this day, to that power of place. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, well, I mean, God, did, uh, did I notice anything about Varanasi? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the problem with Varanasi is that you're flickering constantly between something so beautiful and something so horrible on a sort of sec on a on a minute by minute or second by second basis, I mean it's really quite overwhelming, and it's incom much of it is incomprehensible to me, um, and uh, it would be it would be that really. I mean I think it's also this kind of thing that it's um it's both, I mean it's that combination of being. Um, intensely a, a place that's 
intensely spiritual, of course, and also incredibly physical, so that, you know, it was, uh, that's the place I first, when I, I had this great fear that the first dead body I would ever see would be my parent, my parents, you know. And then, you know, I saw a lot of dead bodies in Varanasi, uh, which I'd never seen before in the, you know, in the, the uh, everywhere else that I'd been, you know, it's, 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 you know, yeah, you, you don't see, you don't see death at all. So there was, there was all, all, all of that, uh, all, all of that going on. It was a kind of, it was a kind of delirium for me, really. And then I guess the other thing that I should say in relation to that is, I was in the middle of writing a little book about Venice, a version of Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, set during the Venice Biennale. And I was in the middle of that and was doing it quite happily. And then the moment I got to Varanasi, I realized that it had to be, the book about Venice should be twinned with Varanasi because the two places are so similar. And there's actually a long tradition of people noticing, uh, noticing that, you know, Allen Ginsberg famously was wandering stoned along the Ghats and was under the impression he was walking along the Grand Canal in, in, in Venice. So that's a mistake that it's very easy to, to make. So that's what was, that was what was going on for me, if I've understood your question correctly. Um, and the other thing about Varanasi, this kind of thing of, um, you know, not my not noticing things. I mean, you, it's, uh, I mean, you'd have to be severely visually impaired not to be noticing a ton of stuff in, in, in Varanasi. And also, I mean, noticing stuff not just with your eyes, but the cognitive demands of trying to process what, what you're seeing if you haven't been brought up in that belief system. Um, we have about five minutes. Any other questions? Or can I use moderator's privilege to uh, ask about uh, this latest book, The Last Days of Roger Federer, um, which is really not about tennis, and Roger Federer gets a few mentions, and that's about it. But it's, it's about the last days. Um, it's about the last lap of the marathon. What, what's that like? Do you mean, uh, for me, on that last lap? Oh, you're picking up the, from, the, from that question earlier. Well, it's about, it's about careers coming to, to an end, really. And, um, you know, what, th this thing of late style has been very well documented. And it's, um, I mean, you know, yeah, it's almost a cliche, this thing of late style now. But um, in the, and it, and it tends to come back to Adorno's essay, Late Style in Beethoven. But I was interested in the way that um, people's, in Beethoven's case, of course, the late works, the last works are the late works. I, they're the works that he makes at the end of his life and they're the culmination of everything that, is, that he's done before. And similarly with the other main person in the book, Turner, his late, late paintings. But then it, what I was interested in the way is that actually people's last works aren't always their late works. So we can think of so many examples of people who whose work stops because they become ill. Coltrane is a good example of that. It's so clear that when Coltrane dies in his 40s, he's in a transitional phase. Coltrane's last works are really his middle works, as other examples. And then we can keep bringing the last forward, and there's so many examples of writers whose last works are, oh, their first work. You know, that large number of writers who quit for whatever reason after one book. So there is that kind of thing. It's not very interesting in a way. You know, at the end of somebody's life, of course, their, pa their powers are diminishing. But I was thinking, what are the internal pressures that bring, um, you know, that, that make somebody call time on their career? Um, why is it that some, or, or why do people keep you know, keep, keep doing something. So those, that was the kind of uh, question I was trying to, uh, to, to examine. And the least interesting version of that, in a way, is the writer or artist who is just driven out of the vocation 
by virtue of economic problems, because of course that's just, I mean, that's just a matter of circumstance. But I felt that it was a, a very good thing for the, the reason that the title of, um, uh, that Roger was in the title was because of this phase he was in whereby he, it seemed he was incapable of beating Nadal and Djokovic. And he kept getting asked, okay, because you're never going to win another Grand Slam, are you going to retire? And he didn't, want, he didn't want to retire because he liked playing tennis so much. And that kind of accommodation with being third best in the world was a really remarkable thing, so different to Bjorn Borg, who the moment that he started losing, he quit at some absurdly, uh, absurdly uh, young age. Anyway, so it's this thing of what keeps, what, what, what gives certain writers or athletes a kind of uh, longevity, really, was something that interested me. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's our time up, I think. Um, let me just conclude. Uh, um, in conclusion, I'd just like to read something of you to you. Okay. Is that okay? Uh, because uh, all through these past few days, people have come up to me and said, which is the Jeff Dyer book you'd recommend? Which is the one you recommend? I recommend them all. They're all outside. But uh, we talked about um, love-hate uh, to begin with. Uh, but uh, um, Jeff wrote, my favorite of his books is But Beautiful, uh, just because I love jazz. And this, this few passages, uh, this few two passages really uh, encapsulates everything I do love about him. Uh, and he writes about somebody I love deeply, Lester Young, the great saxophonist. When he woke, the room was filled with the green haze of a neon sign outside that had blinked to life while he slept. He slept so lightly it hardly even merited the name of sleep. Just a change in the pace of things, everything floating away from everything else. When he was awake, he sometimes wondered if he was just dozing dreaming he was there, dying in a hotel room. His horn lay next to him on the bed. On a bedside cabinet were a picture of his parents, bottles of cologne, and his pork pie hat. He'd seen a photograph of Victorian girls wearing hats like this, ribbons hanging down. Nice, pretty, he thought, and had worn one ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Jeff Dyer that I love. Thank you all for listening. Thank <laughs> you.